now. Hello and welcome to another edition of The Legal Zone, where we tackle injustice. That's what we do on the show. We highlight injustices and we tackle it. Earlier this week, I got an email from an opposing counsel who came across one of our episodes and she was not too happy with our show because we were we was highlighting an injustice that's dealing with the case that she is in. I thought it was kind of funny, but she did not. But that's what we do. People suffer injustices, whether it's media injustice or whether it's real life injustice that's going on in a court case and we tackle it. Today we have a very special guest with us and I will introduce him in a minute. But as usual, let's start with a legal nugget. This time, everyone, I've typed this stuff out beforehand, so I wouldn't waste time typing it as we go. So we're going to talk about employment discrimination today, employment discrimination. And that is a broad umbrella, a broad area of law. But overall, this is an area of law concerning employment discrimination, where employers, the law forbids employers from harassing or discriminating against employees on the basis of these seven things, race, color, religion, sex, and that includes pregnancy, anything related to sex, national origin, age 40, being over the age of 40, or disability. An employer cannot harass or discriminate, treat you differently. When we talk about discriminate, it basically means treat an employee differently from the others. Cannot hire, refuse to hire, cannot fire anyone based on these seven things. Now there are certain steps that if you find yourself being discriminated at the workplace, there's certain steps that you must follow. First, you must file a suit or a file a charge with the EEOC. That's the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. You file a charge with them. And then if they find that you have grounds, they will give you what's called a clear to sue and you can move forward with your suit. There's time limits with this, 180 to 300 calendar days. But employment discrimination is not an easy thing. We've had people come to us, but we haven't taken any of their cases. And this is why. At will employment, just about every state in the United States has what's called at will employment. And at will employment means that an employer can fire an employee at any time for any reason, but not really. Because those seven things that we just highlighted, you cannot an employer cannot fire or mistreat someone for those, any of those reasons. So here you have the big contradiction because if you're fired and you think it's because of your race, your sex, your age, whatever, you have to go about proving it. How do you prove that you were discriminated against for one of the reasons listed above? There's this framework called the McDonnell Douglas framework. And under this framework, an employee must one, present evidence that he or she is a member of a protected class. Show that you're a minority. Show that you're pregnant, whatever. Second, show that he or she was qualified for the position. Were you qualified? Well, you probably were, or that you would have never been hired. Third, you have to show that you suffered an in adverse employment action. Were you fired? Then, you have to show that you were replaced by another worker who is not a member of that protected class. So if you're able to do these, then you might have grounds for an employment uh, suit, but it doesn't stop there. Once the employee shows this, then the employer now can present evidence to justify why the employee was fired in the first place. And more times than not, the employee has committed some sort of undesirable behavior that is now exaggerated by the employer to justify the termination. So it's very difficult to bring these type of cases, but it happens. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So 
please welcome Mr. Abdul Cargbo. Abdul Cargbo grew up in Fort Washington, Maryland and graduated from the Prince George's County public school system. After he completed his undergraduate studies, he moved to the district of DC in 1997. He entered the behavioral health and social services field in 2011, when he started to work as an outpatient mental health clinic clinician serving high needs populations. In the intervening decades, Abdul has worked with returning citizens, homeless populations, undocumented migrants, and persons diagnosed with mental illnesses, substance use disorders, and HIV. He returned back to school in 2014 to pursue a master's degree in social work from Howard University School of Social Work. And then he moved to South Carolina, which he resides now. He's working as a social worker at a, as a psychiatric crisis stabilization unit at a rural community hospital and in the process for applying for his clinical social work license. Now, before Mr. Abdul comes on and starts to tell us about this story, I told you all how employment discrimination is very tricky because most employees, if not all employees who get fired, believe that they were treated unjustly. And then they come to us and we start doing our background information and we find out that the employee actually did things that was warranted being terminated. Someone was late 10 times in 10 days. Someone may have threatened the employer, but then they say, well, I was treated wrongly. In this particular case, I could tell you all that I've known Mr. Abdul for over 30 years. He comes from a very solid background. I know his mother, Leah Cargbo, his aunt, Emma Cisse, his cousin, Noel, his brother, Bode. These are people who are sincere. Never, I know him through high school, never has he been expelled. He's always been compliant. He's always been someone who is respectful to authority. When you hear him talk, he is not the type of person who, if he's treated unfairly, would be treated because of something that he was actually doing. So I say that so people who are listening could know, okay, this is who this person is. Mr. Abdul Cargo, how are you this morning? Doing quite well, Salon. Thank you for that um, very, very kind introduction. Um, yeah, so, even coming in, I the, the reason I um, I'm talking about this sort of in an informal setting. I'm not you know trying to bring legal action against my former employer because it is incredibly difficult to prove that uh, you were treated unjustly because you are an immigrant or a person of color or because of your religion. And even if that were the case, they're not you know your employer is not going to write that down in the reason for termination. Right. My specific case, um, I'll just fast forward to the very end, and then we can work our way backwards. Um, when I was terminated, I was basically called into one of the manager's offices and something, something, and then it was like, just clean up your desk. There was no ongoing conflict. There was no pattern of documentation of bad behavior, or late, being late or anything like that. You were never, you were never written up? Never. In, in fact, um, I was supposed to have um, like a performance evaluation after 90 days on the job. That performance review never happened. And then it happened very quickly and very suddenly about one or two weeks before I was told to clean out my desk. And the way it was done, I, I actually, I, and I, I have a lot of my emails saved because I, I already felt like I was being uh, treated unfairly. Um, but now, I, now, do you feel comfortable telling us who the employer is? Um, I would rather not, but anyone who watches this video who lives and works in the Charleston, South Carolina area will very quickly figure out who it is. Um, okay. And because they're, they're, it's, it's one organization, they run a network of community health centers um, throughout the low country. That's the Charleston, uh, Dorchester and Berkeley counties. Um, <clears throat> but it's also, um, I know just from having worked there and having observed some of the things that happened, they have 
there has been a pattern of people being unceremoniously terminated without cause, but you know, it is a right to work state, so they don't really need cause. Um, but because I now live in South Carolina and there is, obviously I have to be concerned about my own future employment prospects because as my girlfriend put it this morning, most employers do not want former employees, regardless of how they left, uh, bad mouthing them, even if they agree with you, they, you know, you might get blackballed or blacklisted. So I'd rather not name names, but the context, you know, is pretty All right. Cool. All right. Okay, so go ahead. Um, yeah, so the, uh, I moved here, I moved to South Carolina in 2019, and it took me a couple of months to find work, but I did find a job, and it was a community health center, which I was really excited about, because most of my work in D.C. had been at similar places, community health centers. They were hiring for a, an addiction counselor. It was, they had basically applied for a grant, because, you know, South Carolina, like a lot of other rural um, states, is in the grips of, a, at the time, it was an opioid um, epidemic. Um, and so they had received a grant to expand their behavioral health services to include addiction counseling. And um, I had been working in DC as an addiction counselor. My last job before moving to South Carolina was in, as, as an addiction counselor. Um, so I was very excited to take the job. Once I, you know, once I got there, I realized that there were like a lot of, you know, nonprofits and community-based organizations. There's always some cultural uh, dysfunctions within the workplace. Um, a lot of personality conflicts, a lot of things um, that are not necessarily done the way they should be. But one of the things that instantly became clear to me was that there seemed to be an ongoing conflict between the executive director and some of the other executive leadership, um, specifically regarding the behavioral health program. It's, I sort of got the impression that the executive director was trying to become the director of the behavioral health program. Again, this is neither here nor there. None of this is my concern. but. I started coming into conflict with that particular person because they would they would try to sort of take over the operations of the organization, but because they themselves are not trained social in social services, like one of the things that they asked was that we, me, as the addiction counselor, would circulate in the lobby of the clinic and talk to people and try to sort of attract or entice people to come in and get behavioral health services, which anybody who knows anything about behavioral health treatment knows that that is profoundly unethical because A, we, we don't go and solicit, like we do our work, based, it's voluntary. People come to us for help. We don't go out and seek help. And number two- So, so wait, so I, you said that he wanted you to go out and try to she, convince people to come in for, for treatment. Yeah, so basically tell them about our program and kind of ask them what kind of things they needed help with and then offer our services. But of course, going into the lobby of the clinic where there's no privacy and there's, you know, and, and I, I put, I wrote, you know, I put everything in writing, of course, because that's what professionals do. But I said, you know, you wouldn't ask the OBGYN or the urologist, because, you know, it's a multi-specialty practice to go out and start talking to people about urinary problems or digestive problems. Why would you expect that me as, a, as an addiction counselor, as a behavioral health professional, would be able to go into the lobby and start asking people about problems they may be having with depression or anxiety or insomnia or addiction. Um, and, and so, so I think, you know, because, uh, one of the, one of the areas of conflict, there were multiple, but one of them was this idea that I was not going to violate my own ethical codes. Um, I think kind of well, I don't know, made me seem like maybe a person who wasn't with the program who should not be there. Okay, so you chose not to do that? I did not do that. And I laid out my reasons for it in, in, in writing and in email, explaining my own ethical constraints because, you know, privacy and on, anonymity are pretty significant parts of the social worker code of ethics. And how, what was the response to that? Well, the, the official response was nothing. But I think that there was a personal response because at a at a team meeting, um, at, at a team meeting, the executive that we, we had a team meeting where one of the the uh, managers had come in and tried to um, say something, and I I pushed back. It was me and two other social workers. So there were three social workers on total on the behavioral health team and again it, it came back to the same thing like there's certain things we can and cannot do 
because of our ethics, but also we all have experience working in other places. So we bring that experience that we didn't suddenly come to this job and have to learn everything from scratch. Um, the manager went back and communicated this to the executive director who after our meeting had ended, reconvened the meeting, called all of us back into the room and came in and personally singled me out by name and basically berated me in front of the other staff and um, insinuated that I was basically trying, I don't even know what the insinuation was, but that I was sort of trying to undermine her authority. Um, and again, I just repeated what I had said and I referred to the emails I had sent and I made it clear that there are certain things that we can and can't do. And we all have experience doing this work from somewhere else. We didn't just come to this particular facility, community health center, and then come in not knowing how to do anything. And then a week after that, I think is when I was told to clean out my desk. It wasn't by her, but it was by another member of the executive team. Was there anyone else who made the same decision that you made? The decision, you mean, to not do what they were asking? None of the social workers did. Like, we all, we all agreed that it was ridiculous. A lot of the, the things that we were being asked to do, we, we just didn't do. And, but you were the only one who were, was released? No, one of my colleagues was already on the way out. She had already tended her resignation. Another one um, who actually is a, has a higher clinical licensure than I do at the time, she had only been on the job for about a month. She was terminated. And this was about a month or three weeks before I was let go. So there was definitely a, a cleaning out, a, a purge of sorts. Um, everyone had their own reason for why they left or why they were asked to leave. Did they give you a reason why they asked you to leave? No, what there was nothing, no documentation. Nothing was put in writing. The only thing that looked like documentation was like my annual review, which was like a year late, which was hurriedly done. And there were some areas where I felt um, I scored very low, that in my estimation, I should not have scored very low. One of them, of course, was being in uh, interpersonal communication because I had never been, no patient, no other colleague, nobody had ever complained about my communication. I mean, you're a social worker, you go to school to learn how to talk to people. And then the other area was in the use of technology. Uh, we used an electronic health record, which I basically customized from the ground up to, to suit the needs of the behavioral health system. Like I was putting in assessments, you know, for uh, social services, you have to do questionnaires, like a depression questionnaire, PTSD questionnaire. And I was basically incorporating all of these into our existing electronic health record. So for them to give me a very low score on like use of technology, again, I thought that was a little, you know, um, well, disingenuous. And again, I, I put all of these concerns in writing. Um, but then I think the week after the incident where this, the executive director berated me in front of my colleagues, I was out on medical leave because I had a I had an eye surgery. And I think it was a week after I came back from my medical leave that uh, uh, one of the other execs called me and told me to clean up my desk. But there had never been anything in writing. There were no meetings or warnings. There was no anything it was just like well you need to go and the you said the your supervisor berated you in front of the rest of your colleagues that was not the supervisor that was the executive director okay, but she was essentially your superior well she wasn't she is my superior she runs the whole agency but she was not directly in charge of the behavioral health unit do you think what do you think the reason was for that i think that the vibe that I got was that she maybe for reasons of her own felt like she should be heading up the behavioral health department, um, even though she had she doesn't have the background or anything. Uh, but I think it was it was just a personal issue um, because prior to me starting, I had heard rumors that the entire behavioral health unit department had been terminated before so we were like a new crop and then most of us were gone within a year um you know again I don't want to get too much into the mind of another person but I felt I felt that maybe she wanted to hire her own people if that makes sense and so the fact that we were being brought in through another professional track that wasn't directly under her supervision maybe she didn't like that but again I don't I don't really I can't really say now you're you're multicultural, right? I am. 
You speak fluent Russian. Yes, I do. Do you think this had anything to do with the treatment? It's really difficult, again, to make that case. But yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, the low country down here, I know that you're from Alabama. The demographics are very similar. You know, South yeah, Carolina I, is a majority I lived in Alabama. State. I lived in Alabama. I'm not from... <laughs> Go ahead. Um, but the, the demographics are very similar. And so this organization is, I would proudly, I would proudly call it a, a black organization. It's black led, it's black run, and the majority of the population that we serve are, are black people and people of color. There is a growing Hispanic population in South Carolina in the Charleston area. And there, there were, there's a large, not a large number, but there was a fair number of uh, Hispanic employees, many of whom left or were terminated under similar circumstances to me. And I know this because I spoke to people directly. I mean, what I'm trying to say in a, in a roundabout way is that there was a culture of sort of bullying and exclusion of uh, non-Black um, people at the organization. And I don't necessarily think it's so much a racial thing, but I think it's more of a cultural thing in the sense that the leadership team were bringing on their own people who happened to be Black people, Black Americans. And if you were not part of that in-group, then you were kind of uh, an outsider. And That's so one of the things that I had brought up almost as soon as I started was um, I was in a meeting and one of my colleagues who is, um, who was, she ended up leaving, uh, but she is a Hispanic. She's from uh, Central America. She speaks English fluently, but with a heavy uh, accent. And she came in and she said something in English, which of course I had no trouble understanding. But then when she left, one of my other colleagues who's a black lady made a joke about, you know, what did she say? Or I have no idea what she said, which I was, I thought was kind of inappropriate because we shouldn't make fun of people who have accents, you know? Um, and I had brought that to the attention of the leadership team um, as an example of just kind of a culture of exclusion that made me not feel comfortable because not only am I an immigrant, but I am also multilingual. And I would hate to think that somebody would be making fun of my accent or the way I speak English, you know, behind my back. And you, now you, ra and you, you raise an interesting point and I'm gonna just ask you point blank, do you, see or did you see any sort of cultural discrimination among the African Americans and the non-African Americans, even though they may have been- Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Another one of my colleagues also um, from South America, I wouldn't identify her as Hispanic because she, she didn't grow up in the US. She came to the US for her college studies, but she is from another South American country, also speaks English fluently, but with an accent. <clears throat> she also, she and I became good friends, but she also lived in a part of the country that has a very specific accent that's specific to that part of the country. So she actually picked up that regional accent. And then when she came to work at, at the place where I was working, people would ask her, why do you talk that way? Um, and I witnessed, I, I witnessed directly her being kind of bullied and harassed. Like one of the things that she was always like, the insinuation was that she was always trying to flirt with other people's husbands, which of course I know her, she's happily married. She was never doing that. But I think that there are certain people who dislike you for certain reasons and then they they want to you know they want to make your work experience uncomfortable another significant issue was that we did not have forms because you know again when you're doing social services like behavioral health work you have to do a lot of interviews and questionnaires we did not have any of those forms in spanish we only had them in english and we had no uh fluent no um, clinicians who were fluent in Spanish to conduct those assessments and I never felt comfortable because I'm not fluent in Spanish I never felt I, was, I had the linguistic qualifications to deal with that population so I wrote an email and I said that you know it's a violation of federal law for us to not have to try to provide behavioral health clinical services without you know um, doc documentation without forms that, that that are available in people's first languages um, that issue was never resolved at the time of my termination but I definitely had brought up a lot of concerns and issues, not even necessarily focused at me directly, because like I said, it's hard for me to prove that I was being singled out or mistreated because I am a foreigner or whatever, but I witnessed my colleagues being treated very unfairly. And then also seeing how the patients were treated by not, not investing, not putting in any effort to make forms available, you know, forms or signage available in, uh, in Spanish, I always thought was, was problematic because in this area, even though the vast majority of our, the people that we were serving are, you know, Black Americans, 
we, there is a growing population of Spanish speakers who are also high needs and um, need our services. Okay, so but I, I want to hit on something because I'm sure a lot of people are shocked to discover when even people in this country, but definitely outside of the country, usually when you hear of racism and discrimination, it's usually white, black. Yeah. But what I'm hearing you say, this is black, black. Is that right? Well, yes, but also um, one, yes. Um, in non, this particular, non black and African American black. Yes. In this it's particular the context, the majority of the black people I work with are from this area, from the Low Country. And there is, and uh, I think there is an in group versus out group mentality that grows out of that. And I witnessed it firsthand. Wow. Now, in the beginning of the show, I forgot to introduce our backbone to this show, Dr. Cheney and John Salati. Dr. Cheney, jump in on this because you're African-American female from Southern Virginia. What are your thoughts on, on this? What questions do you have for Mr. Abdul? Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. I know a bit about interpersonal communication. I want to do something that we, we've done before. And basically, when evaluations are done in organizations mm -hmm. to problem solve, and that's pretty much what we're, we're talking about. Organizational culture, organizational climate, and leadership. Areas like that are examined. And basically, this is the foundation for my three questions. And the first one, and I'll explain because we've got definitions for everything. Uh, what kind of organizational culture existed? And what I mean by that is pretty much what you've described, maybe not given it a name, but the rules, the policies, the way things are done in an organization is basically the culture. Absolutely. Because the way it's done in federal government, let's say, mm -hmm. and a lot of my experience was in private industry. Mm -hmm. And I got a job in the federal government and I couldn't believe it. At 11.30, most people were running to lunch. Mm -hmm. And I was in book publishing and a lot of the folk I dealt with were from New York City. We were going to lunch at 12 o'clock and it was a drink at lunch and we didn't come back until five. So you see the culture yes. is really different. Very different so, culture. Very different. Did you ever experience being closed down or verbally silenced or made to feel your contributions were rendered less than maybe some of your other colleagues? I would say yes and yes, in the sense that a lot of those concerns that I had raised about having the languages available, uh, the bilingual, um, having the uh, forms available in Spanish, about um, some of the way I had observed my colleagues being treated, these were issues that I made public because I don't believe that I, as one person, can, can fight or change the system. So everything, everything that I have told, uh, that I have shared here, uh -huh. I, I have documentation of in emails that I had sent. Um, some of the issues um, were more of a personal nature, like the one about my colleague who was always being reprimanded for the way she dressed or the insinuation was that she was flirting with other people's husbands. Those issues I observed, but I didn't get involved in because you know we were not on the same team. We were colleagues, and I knew we were friends, but I didn't get involved in that because that was you know a little bit outside my scope um, for my department. The organizational culture, as I observed it, was one where if you were part of the executive director's inner circle, you were okay. And so one example is. Um, our, the person who she picked to head up our behavioral health unit was a, a nurse. Um, uh, she had, actually, I don't even think she had finished her nursing degree. She was working on it because I think you have to be, you have to have a bachelor's degree to be a, to be a nurse. And I think her highest degree was an associate's degree. So she had worked as an NA nursing assistant. 
but because she was she was promoted up through the administrative track as opposed to a clinical track, she was put in charge of the behavioral health department, even though she herself did not have the background. And there were much more qualified people on that unit, myself included, and the two other social workers um, and who ended up leaving. And there was another social worker who I didn't even really talk about because she was there when I started and she was gone after we had the first set of layoffs for COVID, which was like in the, I think early in 2021. And, and again, I don't, I want to keep things as concrete as possible because there's a lot of speculation when it comes to what's going on with other people. So we would have these agency-wide staff meetings that we would all log into via Zoom. So just like I'm looking at you, everyone is looking at everyone, but the executive team would all call in from the executive conference room so we could see all of them in one row. And it was very common, like you were saying, with the culture in the federal government and in New York, where some of the other managers who I think were part of the executive director's inner circle would come in late for that meeting. So we could see them coming in late, carrying their Chick-fil-A bags or their lunch bags after the meeting has already started. And that, you know, considering that um, actually one of the reasons that was given unofficially for me being terminated was that I missed a meeting with a guy who was a friend of mine and it was an informal meeting and he had canceled on me many times because he was the IT guy. I kind of thought shows that, you know, if you are part of that inner circle, the rule, there's a different set of rules that apply to you. I actually wrote a very long email to the executive team sharing with them my observations about the culture of dysfunction within the organization. One of them being the fact that the majority of staff were always running around frantic, overworked, stressed out. And then there were certain people who just seemed like they were just on easy street. And those people were always the ones who were within the executive director's inner circle you know and, and again i don't want to make disparaging remarks but one of my colleagues who the one who she was a social worker she had put in her resignation a week before i i was let go she is also a, a black female from the low country from the hilton head community but she grew up in new york and she used an example which i think really encapsulated the issue at this particular organization she said the organization was run like an hbcu and me and both of and me as an alumnus of Howard University, I also am familiar with some of these um, systems of dysfunction and how they can embed themselves. Um, and so that was kind of like our little in, you know inside joke. It, it is unfortunate because one of my biggest complaints about working at this place was that as a recipient of federal uh, grant dollars, we had an obligation, perhaps even a higher obligation than most. To make sure that those funds were uh, were appropriately uh, used to serve the community, because we live in a country where people are very opposed to the idea of poor and high needs communities receiving federal funding, and so as recipients of federal funds, I felt like we had a, a higher burden of responsibility to make sure that our service, not just the service we give, but also the quality of our organization, was above reproach. And I think that may also have been one of the reasons that I got kind of, you know, got on the wrong side of the in crowd and was unceremoniously asked to leave. Right. It, it sounds to me like you're a whistleblower too, and you were not protected under the whistleblower statute. How many employees were there in that organization, just roughly? And they probably in the hundreds, three, maybe low hundreds, three figures, because they right. have a, they, are, they have a number of different clinics, so, so clinical sites. And each of these clinical sites is, is administered by a, what they call a site manager, who basically ends up being sort of like the clinical director for that specific site. And you and have so, an HR department, you have to have had that. Uh, Human resources, you had to have that. And the, the other HR thing I want to know is you think about the that. The HR Were department, um, one of the people on the HR department is a Hispanic woman who was discriminated against as soon as she was hired. She was reprimanded for speaking Spanish to another colleague. And so she very quickly turned around and brought a lawsuit. Yeah. So that should tell you the, the, the shape of, our, of the HR department at this particular organization. And, and a lot of the things that I'm saying I know, but I'm not going officially on the record because mm -hmm. they did not happen to me. I know because I heard that had happened to other people, but I was present on at least one occasion where one of my colleagues was mocked for speaking English with a Spanish accent. And I have definitely been present where other colleagues of mine had grumbled under their breath about 
my colleagues speaking Spanish to each other um, okay. in the presence. Now, were you a contract employee or a non-contract? No, no, no. I was hired as the regular full-time. Okay. I had the state pension, um, mm -hmm. the, the state health insurance plan. That's one of the perks of working at this particular employer because when you work in these kinds of nonprofits that receive government funding, you don't expect that the pay is going to be great, but you do get all the state, all the same benefits as state employees, including the pension and the health plan. And hopefully you would hope that you get treated a little bit better. Uh, in my case, that was not my experience. And the really unfortunate thing, you know, obviously I was able to find another job. I, have, I already had a job offer on the table when I was terminated. So I wasn't too, you know, broken up about it, but I didn't like the way everything went down. But the real issue is that as Americans, having a job or not having a job, it's not a choice anymore. Like we need to work. And some of us spend more time at our places of work than we spend at home or at play or really anywhere else. And the workplace is one of the few parts of American society where we are still expected to give up any idea of freedom or fairness or democratic principles. Like you're, you're supposed to just show up at your place of work, hope your boss is not a total narcissistic bully and if they are, the assumption is that you will just find another job. And that's not always a luxury that every person has. So mo many people, and I'm sure many of, many of your viewers watching, are probably suffering under the, these conditions where they have very few rights. You know, for instance, the executive director would never have just walked up to another person in public and berated him the way she did to me. Because that's actually, you know, that's actually against the law if you do that in the public square. But doing it in the safety of, 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 a, of, a, of a meeting room in, in the facility that you run somehow makes it seem more okay. Right. I have two quick ones. Yes, ma'am. We talked about organizational climate. You pretty much have, to have described that because we're talking about employees' perception of their work environment. And you pretty much describe that. Um, there was, it doesn't look like there were any praising going on for the contributions you made. So you, and the policies look like they were closed door versus open door. So Absolutely. Much, uh, it yeah. was very authoritarian, very top down. Uh, in fact, one of the complaints that I always had, including some of my other colleagues was, let's talk about these things together so we can arrive at, at, at solutions. But what was actually happening, like the thing about going out and, and unethically speaking to people about mental health problems in the lobby, if you had a social worker or a licensed clinician at the table, nobody would ever have thought that was a good enough idea to be handed down to the team. But because they met in seclusion, they handed it down to us. And then when we pushed back, I think we all suddenly got uh, 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 bullseyes, targets on our back. Right. Uh the other thing that is on my mind, were they in financial trouble to have you recruiting in the lobby? I don't think they were in financial trouble. I think this was one person's idea of what a behavioral health um, professional should do. This organization, like I said, they had just gotten a grant from the federal government, I believe. Um, they also have partnerships with um, MUSC, Medical University of South Carolina. It, it, it's kind of like a John Hopkins University in the low country. You know, they do a lot of um, clinical work and research. Um, and I think that once the COVID pandemic started, mm -hmm. that organization also jumped feet first into it. And, you know, they were doing some really good work. I can give them credit for their COVID response. You know, they had mobile testing units. And then once the vaccines were available, they started offering vaccines. So, Financially, they were doing fine, but mm. I heard before I started um, that the previous, the, the predecessor of the current executive director had been embezzling funds from the organization. Mm. But at the time that I was there, I think they were doing quite well. You know, they were stable. So I don't know. I think that was more of a power thing. It's more, of an, it was more of the executive director saying, this is what I would have my clinicians doing if I ran the department. And I think it was more of a power play. As it turned out, it was a completely unethical uh, and unprofessional approach because, again, you would not have the OB out in the lobby asking people about their reproductive health. That's you would not do. No. But no. because she was not directly over the MDs, the MDs were under a medical director who was part of the um, executive team. But you know, 
we as behavioral health, we were not yet under our own department. And so it was a conflict between her and the other member of the executive team who had actually applied for the grant. And I think maybe she thought that she should be running that behavioral health department, even though it was his program. That's the vibe I picked up anyway. Yeah, based on my research, you've, you've experienced what I, what I came up with a concept called organizational communication culture shock. But let me, <laughs> I let like me, that. Yeah, that was my dissertation. Let me tell you about the last one. You pretty much have covered this. Leadership, leadership style. What do we say? There's autocratic, there's democratic, and you do the French lazy and lazy affair. Okay, and we could throw in contingency, but basically you've already described, and you can say it. Which one would you think would be the category here? Oh, I would definitely say authoritarian. I definitely believe yeah. that the the whole approach was that I, as the leader, as the executive director, have nothing to learn from you, the workers, based on the simple fact that I am the executive director. As I had mentioned before, we had there were three social workers still working in the department when the confrontation had what confrontation when she came in and yelled at me in front of my colleagues and I, one of the things i had said to her was we are coming here with over you know 30 decades of combined professional experience like let us do the work that we know how to do we went to school to do it but she was more invested in in creating the image that we were not competent so she would often say things like you guys are not ready you're not ready yet and i remember thinking ready for what? We're already doing the work. We're already seeing patients. We're already doing assessments. We're already helping people, you know, because we had a psych we had two psychiatrists as well. So it does seem, you know, again, I, I realized that this, I think that as a, as a person who works, as a worker in the United States, I feel like we have a right to exchange our labor for a wage, right? That is the definition of being a, a working professional, being a member of the working class. When we show up to work, we should be measured, we should be rewarded, we should be judged, we should be reprimanded and punished according to our performance, not according to any member of the leadership's uh, preferences or prerogatives. And I feel like in this case, this was a member of the, the, the executive director who had an agenda and we maybe did not neatly fit into that agenda. And as a result, we ended up having to A, work in a hostile, toxic work environment, and then B, ended up being terminated in various different ways that were not fair or just. Yeah, and the last thing I was gonna ask you, but you pretty much again described it. Uh, over the years, I've come in contact with a very interesting book called The One Minute Manager. And basically, the foundation with a lot of the books is a series is that you need to praise employees for the contributions that they do make in the workplace. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And I think you, you, you have a lot to offer, and they knew it. And I guess they didn't feel that you were on their team. I think uh, I'm afraid that that is the only conclusion I can come away with. I, I did stay in touch with a couple of my, the people I had made friends with who were still there. And they, you know, they said, the patients have no one now. There is no addiction counselor. And you know, I was starting to build relationships with my patients. And that really was the part that hurt me the most was because I didn't get a chance to terminate properly with my patients. You know, people are vulnerable, especially when you're dealing with people who have experienced a lot of trauma, as you as is the case when you're dealing with substance use disorders and mental illness. It takes them time to trust, it takes them time to open up. And then as soon as they begin to build a rapport with me or with my predecessor, because apparently my predecessor was also unceremoniously terminated. So this is an organization that is indirectly harming patients by mistreating staff, mm -hmm. and yet they still continue to receive federal dollars. That that's the part that bothered me the most. Well, mm -hmm. no, a lot of this bothered me a lot, but that's one of the things that bothered me a lot is that we all pay into making these community health centers exist and available because we we want to pay our fair share because we know that there are other people out there who need those services and sometimes those people could be our friends or family members and sometimes it could even be us so we pay into it so i was not just an employee of that uh, community health center but i'm also a benefit a beneficiary be benefactor because if part of the funding comes out of my taxes mm -hmm. so you know, why should I have to go and be mistreated and treated poorly 
by a woman whose salary also likewise comes from the taxes that we as the employees contribute. You know what I mean? Right. I right. do. John Salati, we want to get you in here. John Salati is one of the partners at our firm. Mr. Salati. Well, again, good morning, Mr. Cogbo. I feel for you. You have laid out a scenario of having been mistreated. I don't think there's any question at all in any scenario where someone could dispute um, the kind of poor treatment you experienced at that community health center, which is, as you point out, a double failing because that is a public organization doing work for the community. Uh, so I think that that even makes it worse. To jump back now to what Salon laid out at the beginning about employment discrimination, what you describe reminds me of many phone calls I recall getting years ago from people uh, taking, doing intake for, in a sense, Title VII employment discrimination cases, where people would describe, well, this was done to me, and that was done to me, and this was done, and I'd say, okay, you've been treated badly. The problem is, particularly probably in a place like South Carolina, that's not, that's not going to rise to the level of one of those seven categories that Salon laid out, race, gender, uh, religion, um, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so therein lies a real bind for somebody like you. I would get those calls all the time and I have to say, yeah, you're right. You were treated badly. But I'm trying to think of how to say this on a public program because what I used to say to them over the phone when they would talk to me, I don't know what I could say here. <laughs> you can be a bad person. Let's just phrase it that way. And that is not illegal right. <laughs> under Title Seven. And I, I was doing this in Georgia at the time. And the only law that anything you had to fall back on was the federal law, which is somewhat, which is great, but it's fairly vague and it's sort of vague, broad, but it didn't have a lot of depth. If you lived in a, another state, let's say, I think Maryland, you know, there, there's, a, a, there's a state level of law, it's particularly when you work them together, it gives you a lot more protection and so I really don't have a, a question, but it's just this observation about your scenario, which is truly horrific that somebody could be treated so poorly. And yes, you, you raise points about, well, they, they didn't treat people well, let's say based on certain ethno or cultural reasons. Or yeah, there were the, the even the whole thing about in-group and out-group, well, in-group and out-group, unless you can say, well, the in-group was one of those categories or the out-group was one of those categories, God, there's nowhere to go. I mean, EOC is going to toss that back and say, well, it's not going to fly. And so I could totally understand where somebody in your situation. But that, that, that in-group, out-group, let's talk about that. Does it fall under one of these? What I heard him say the national origin of the people who were doing the ill treatment was different from the national origin of the people who were being mistreated. And in this particular case, what's shocking is African-Americans who have a history of being discriminated against, it seems as though they're now doing the discriminating. Is that a fair assessment? Abdul? I think it is a fair assessment, but it would also be unfair if I did not, if I failed to mention that the majority of the people who work there are also Black American um, from the Low Country, and many of whom were also treated very badly. Okay, so the leadership, that. the leadership, the, the sort of problematic in-group that I was talking about was all uh, Black American women. 
but so was the vast majority of the rest of the organization, including many of my other colleagues who were also treated badly and who were not Hispanic. So it is, I, I, realize, I, I realize that the argument, the, you know, the case that we're discussing is a very sort of legalistic, um, it would be very difficult to make the argument that um, every single person who was treated badly was Hispanic. That's not the case. Okay. It's definitely more of an institutional culture thing. And unfortunately, there is no law against bad institutional management or bad institutional. Or even cliques, right? You could have cliques in, in, the, in any workplace. Yeah. But once, once when the clique is formed around any of these seven, that's when a red flag is raised, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. Oh, I think we lost him. Yeah, we, he'll come back. Because the next month we have an African American black history rather uh, special for the entire month. And I think this topic that you're bringing is very interesting. Um, Dr. Cheney, while we wait for while we wait for John to come back, you are a graduate of Howard, correct? Yeah, twice. Yeah. Oh, okay. I am in a, I am in esteemed company. Oh, great! Yeah, I went to what is it? The Graduate School of Arts and Science. My degree is in organizational communication. The terminal degree and the one before that is in history, Caribbean studies, and uh, intercultural communication. So yeah. Those well, are... I definitely feel like this particular organization that I worked at could benefit from a lot of these, um, these concepts because they seem like they're completely unknown. Yeah, and I worked at Howard, so I know what you're talking about. So it's interesting. Yeah, you... I, I just think that you, you, what you've done is, you've spoken truth to power and sometimes they don't like it and I can relate to it. So, cause I'm considered a hell raiser. So I, I the world know, needs I hell raisers. Hmm? The world needs hell raisers. <clears throat> you have to speak up. Happens. Yeah, but you have to speak up. Now that this has happened <clears throat> to you, Abdul, has it changed you individually? Meaning if you were to do it all over again, knowing the outcome, would you have done anything differently? That, that's really the saddest part. I mean, I, I have had a lot of time to think about this. And in my new job going in, I made up my mind that I would, I would keep my head down and focus on the work and <sighs> figure out how I can do the work. Now, I don't, I, I'm hoping that this is not like a permanent personality change because, you know, people who know me know that that's not my natural setting. But I consider moving to South Carolina as my second immigration, my second immigrant experience, you know, obviously moving to the US at the age of 15 and then moving down here, it's sort of like my second immigrant experience. So I'm sort of having to start all over again because as, a, as an immigrant, you know that you got to, you know, keep your mouth shut when sometimes you want to speak up and you got to take jobs that maybe you wouldn't have taken in your native, you know, country. But this is part of my journey and um, I, I would do things differently. <clears throat> There were a lot of things that were going on at that first job, uh, you know, including, like I think I mentioned in passing, the first social worker who was already there, who was let go like three months after we got there. She was a white lady and she also complained and she felt like she was being treated unfairly. And I saw it, I observed it. And when I spoke up, when I tried to advocate for her, I was punished because this is a network of clinics all around the low country. They have clinics that were as far as an hour and a half away from where I live. And so guess which clinic I was assigned to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so th there are a lot of things, again, it's the, the, puni the bad treatment, like Mr. Saladi said, that's pretty obvious. Proving that it was because of my race or religion or ethnicity, that's a lot harder to prove. And I don't think it's by accident. I think the law is set up that way. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we just do not have a basic standard of decency and dignity in the workplace, which if we had, maybe if we had unions or if we had a strong labor representation culture like we have in some of the other uh, advanced economies like France, Germany, Canada, where, you know, you, an employer, a, a worker is not just considered um, a piece of property and the employer is not a king. 
Uh, and unfortunately in the US, I think we still have some work to do. So I guess the sort of long winded answer is yes, I have changed things. Um, I, I keep my head down. I try to stay focused on my own personal development goals. And I, I try to, I try, I'm less invested in changing the institutional culture. And, and, so, I, so you... and, and I just want to say, I know <laughs> you, Abdul, and I know that probably won't last for long. If they push you enough, you'll speak up <laughs> and you'll go back to what what you did the first time. Welcome back, John Salati. We oh, love John is back. My apologies. Uh, yeah, the whole thing just crashed and I didn't know it and no doubt was speaking long and loud <laughs> to myself. <laughs> I'm sorry Which, we missed that. Well, I don't know where it dropped out. Uh, I, but to try to summarize, it was just a sense of you've been treated badly and the real injustice, hopefully this is, we can get to this, Although the obvious injustice was the poor treatment you received in-house within that agency. But for the kinds of things that we talk about in this program, what strikes me is the bigger injustice is the systemic failure of the law to give you anything to fall back on. Title Seven is not a really great tool. It's, it's better than nothing. I'm going to say that really clearly. It's important to have. Uh, but it tell, is a, tell, tell the audience more about Title VII so they know. Well, Title VII is the federal law that deals with employment discrimination, which Salon broke down in detail with the seven categories at the front end. And so yeah, you have that, but unless you live in a place, other states will have their own layer on top of that, which South Carolina is not one of those places, nor where I first did this in Georgia. No, there is no Georgia law to provide protections. All you had was Title VII. And so unless you have that other layer, you're often left out in the cold. And you know what, what does somebody like you do? Um, yes, they treated employees poorly at times, but the fact that they made fun of some of your colleagues just means they're jerks, to use that word. And being a jerk is not against the <coughs> law. Uh, Title no. VII does not reach to jerk bosses. Right. And, and okay, well, yeah, okay, they were women uh, from countries uh, the, uh, of Central and South America. So maybe you're saying, well, there's a national origin question there. But is that, is there enough there to be able to say that that was the discriminatory moment? Right, and that's the injustice because even if it were the case, say, and Abdul just got through saying that even though they were international employees that were mistreated, there were actual employees who were of the same national origin who were also terminated. That defeats the discrimination laws. Right. So if I, have, word, if I have five, is, well, go ahead, Simone. if I have five employees and I'm discriminating against them because of their race, color, religion, or whatever, but then I choose one who is outside of that, then you can't really prove this. See how easy it is for employers to sidestep this, even though the true intent might have been discrimination. And, or I, I want to even say in this case, I doubt what was going on there really would fall within the ambient of legally defined discrimination. It's more as Mr. Cargbo continually pointed out, this, this boss wanted to run things her way. And if he just told the line, he'd be fine. He'd be there today. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have cared whether he did, you know, was from this national origin or this or that, it's, it was all a power play. So he was discriminated against in what, what we might in casual conversation talk about discrimination that he was treated differently than others. 
But basically, he was treated differently than others because he spoke his mind and he spoke truth to power. Yeah. Or was it, Abdul, was it that cut and dry? Or could it have been more sinister in that, and I'm just throwing this hypothetical, she created this scenario knowing you wouldn't do it to give her a reason to fire you. <laughs> in other words, she really didn't want you to do it. She just said, look, if I tell this guy to do this, I know he's going to say no, and that would give me whatever I need to terminate him. I, I'll be honest with you, Salon, I did consider that possibility, but remember um, that they had had several waves of social services people who had been un, un, uh, um, summarily terminated um, before me, including a psychiatrist who I now work with at my new job. He and I haven't spoken about it yet, but you know, just seeing him uh, and knowing that he is a competent person in other words, it's, it is, malice is there. It's very hard to prove. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that a lot of these laws that we're talking about that give employers, you know, carte blanche to mistreat workers in any way, I do think that they are rooted in this country's very deep and dark history of uh, exploitation of workers. And unfortunately, the racism that went along with that. Um, one of the things that is really sad and heartbreaking to me is that this is an organization that serves primarily Black people with a primarily Black leadership, and they have very comfortably insinuated themselves into this system that is in itself based on, in this exploitation and, and mistreatment of workers. And they, they, they don't care. Their, prim their primary, yes, I think it's fun for the in-group to, to, to crack jokes about the Hispanic workers behind their backs. I'm sure they enjoy that. But I don't know if that is their driving motivation. I think their driving motivation is to hold on to power because there are many young black women who I was also friends with who were also treated very badly. You know, there's a certain type of the black problem. Woman. I'm sorry? Well, yeah, and there's the problem in terms of the, the strictness of employment discrimination claims. Again, being a jerk boss or an authoritarian is not against federal law. Sadly. And that's, that's what we have to sort of be sharing with the, our audience is this sense of understanding there's a difference between being treated badly and rising to the level of what would be considered a federally recognized uh, breach of Title VII law. And everything you say, Mr. Gogbo, leads me back to that. Yep, you've been treated badly, but there's no claim here. Even when we go justice. into the things about national origin, in the end, it's still because, see, the young black women there, we're going to go back to that. They're going to say, well, see, we fired black women. Yeah. We yeah. treat everyone equally badly. Treating, <laughs> treating members of your own ethnic or national group badly should not be a get out of jail free card. But unfortunately, it sounds like it is. Right. It, well, it's certainly going to make your job as a plaintiff much, right. much harder in that McDonnell Douglas framework. Yeah, you can say, this is what I experienced, and I saw this, and I saw this, and I saw this. Let's say that's okay, and you cross that first hurdle. You've made a viable claim of discrimination, but then as Salon says, now the scene shifts, and it goes over to the employer where they get to say, well, even if we say what he's saying is true, here's what, what we have to show that that isn't discrimination. Here's what we did, here's what he did, here's what we did, here are the other things, blah, blah, blah. And now that gets thrown onto the other side of the scale. And now you have to come back and show, well, that reason they just gave is they're making it up. What, what in the law is called pretext. Yeah, 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 that's all. But that isn't really what they did or why they did. Your job as the plaintiff in that scenario is, is you've got quite a hill to climb. That is and, and impossible. Employers have gotten savvy enough to know not to necessarily to do too stupid a set of things. It still happens. Oh yeah, the woman gets pregnant and bam, she's fired. It's like, you were really that stupid? What? It still happens, but not like 20 years ago, let's say. 
that sort of thing happened all the time. And yeah, plaintiffs are winning cases because there's the evidence, boop, 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 boop. And it was so clear. Yeah, so employers have gotten much more subtle. And so the injustice there is things like this, they're happening and they will continue to happen and there's little to no recourse. Abdul, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. We're happy to know that now you're actually in a new position and you're not dealing with that, but we're not happy to hear that the people in the community that was benefiting from you can no longer do that. Are you still able to see some of your clients? Yeah. No, no. See, that's, that's, that's an injustice. Thank you for coming on. Dr. Thank Cheney, you. as always, thank you for your questions and your input and your presence. Mr. Salati, thank you again. And we will see you all next week. Bye-bye. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to meet both of you. All right. Take care. Thanks for watching our video. For experienced legal services in Washington, D.C., Alabama, and Washington State, visit our website at remuslaw.com or call us at 1-833-329-1799. Wait a little bit longer. Wait a little, we'll be coming around again. Cause you know we're stronger than we were when you and I began. I don't know what's harder. Holding on and letting go. I don't know if we are The lessons taught in the adventures of Uncle Billy and Ross are lessons that adults learn late in life. Some never learn it. I will recommend every parent, every young person, every adult, read this book. But more importantly, apply the lessons.